the street theater and um, a muse and the dancers are all a manifestation of something very interesting. I mean, I'm sure there are an infinite variety of scenarios to describe what this is all about. But here's one. Um, human, human has um, not only prehensile capabilities, uh, but these incredible frontal lobes, which allow us to reason, analyze, forget the left-right business for the moment, I'm an old-fashioned person. So there's a conceptual space up here. Plan, think, technology, science, knowing we know. It's a power, it's what in, in India is called a siddhi, or a power. <clears throat> and the warning always in yoga is, along the way in your evolution, you will start to get powers. But just be careful you don't get lost in them. But uh, when you get something that's as this powerful as these frontal lobes, it gets awfully seductive. You begin to think that maybe you've got enough power to take over and turn it into a huge manifestation of ego. In other words, you'll make the universe the way you, ego, wants it. You, intellect, wants it. So you create this world that is more and more technologically sophisticated, more and more thinky, and then it starts to get off balance a little bit. It gets a little... What happens is there's another part of you all the time you're getting this rush off overthink. Look, I can go to the moon, I can sit on the moon, I can make my life so easy. All that time, there's another part of you that has just been lying dormant, put down by your ego and your conceptual universe. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, when I was a professor, uh, we used to say, Strong people are rational. They think. Weak people, women, <laughs> intuit. And isn't it funny that our salvation turns out to lie in our intuition? Isn't it funny? Yeah. And look who had it. <laughs> sitting around being long-suffering. Well, actually, we all have it, but whose role allowed it to exist? Who kept the flame going? Uh, because of that nesting, that kind of earth connection. That earth connection. And what you're seeing in these scenes is the awakening of the intuitive connection in people that makes something inside of them say, hey, you know, something isn't right here. Just a feeling of something's out of balance a little bit. And it's very Taoist. It's very much as when the wind blows, the trees bend. It's that quality of response. It's very deep inside beings. It's in the... Uh, the old man at the town meeting in Vermont. It's in the, uh, I'm sure, many people uh, in Russia. It's in Billy Graham, strangely enough. You know, it's, uh, it's deep in. It's deep in. It's for, in Physicians for Social Responsibility. It's... Uh, It's in each of us. It's in uh, holistic health movements, in ecology movements. It's in uh, 
things like Amnesty International and feeding people like Oxfam and care. It's something inside of us that is connected to everything. See, our intuitive mind doesn't know it knows, it just is. It's the difference between wisdom and knowledge. You are wise, you know knowledge. And it's interesting, the Tao says the student learns by daily increment. Increment, you learn more and more each day. The way is gained by daily loss. Loss upon loss until at last. It's like, lest ye be born, lest ye be born and become as little children. To get into the way, into the way of things. I've been studying a little book for seven years, somewhere around here. It's called the um, Sin Sin Ming. It's only a little book. And um, it's the whole life writings of a man named the Third Chinese Patriarch of Zen. And I was with a Tibetan rascal named Trungpa Rinpoche at one point. He's a lama. And uh, I came into his room and I... Um, and after our interview, he said, uh, Ramdas, I... Hope you get a chance to read the third Chinese patriarch of Zen. I said, I'd like to. And I left the room, and it was in the middle of a big weekend, and I went downstairs, and there were hundreds of people, and there was a Tibetan nun there, a Vancouver, Canadian nun, but had studied in Tibetan Buddhism. And she came up to me, and she hugged me, and she said, oh, Ramdas, it's so good to see you. I'd love to give you a gift. And she rustled through her bag and she said, I'll give you this. And she handed me a copy of the third Chinese patriarch of Zen. You see, so so uh, that's an interesting way to get something. So I started to work with it. And I'll just take the first line. First line says, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. See, I'm still on that one, and it's only uh, eight years now. Hmm. See, I suffer from a, what you'd call vertical schizophrenia. Let's see if I can describe it, because it might all come clear as you're listening to me, make it a little easier for you. See, one part of me is old Dick Alpert. And old Dick Alpert wants what he can get. He's insecure, he's frightened, he's separate, he's still got his old neuroses. All of his lust and greed and ill will and fear and pain and doubt and confusion. And he's constantly sort of looking up, like, get me out of here. Okay. 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 That's Dick. And uh, he sometimes imitates the next guy, Ramdas. See? So somebody comes up and says, Oh, Ramdas, such a joy to be with you. And Dick says, Wouldn't you like to come up and see my holy pictures? So that's the. Uh, <laughs> Now, the quality of Ramdas is that he has one eye looking down and one eye looking up, sort of like Aurobindo. Because he is Ramdas, servant of God, so he is looking towards God, and he is um, also serving, or he is serving God through serving people because servant of God is a lineage. It's a tradition, which means 
the relation of the devotee to God as of servant to master. So you serve and you become an impeccable servant, which in this society is far out, isn't it? Do you have any servants? No, I don't have servants. I'm not a servant. Everybody's a master in this society. Isn't it funny? The energy each of us have in our homes, or not each of you, but most people, is equal to 200 slaves. Isn't that far out between your car and your electricity and all that? If you, if you had 200 slaves, it would just about cover it. So in uh, the way, the method is the method of serving. Like others are Radha and Krishna, for example, the method of love, lover. Now, um, meaning sexual lover, but the, or yin yang lover. But devotee is seeing all of it as God and being in the relation of service to it. Just like Mother Teresa is a mad bhakti. See, because she really, really loves Jesus. I mean, it's, it's a scandalous love affair. See? She loves Jesus so much that her every act, all she sees is her lover. She's so flipped out now that all she can see is Jesus. So when she's handling a baby or somebody dying or she's cleaning up vomit or wiping somebody, she's playing with Jesus. She's having a love affair. From where we look, we say, isn't she good? How would you like to be making mad love for the rest of your life and everybody's saying, isn't she good? <laughs> or isn't he good? Isn't that an interesting coming together of parts of your being? I'm good and then I make love. Or I make love good or, you know. So that role of servant to master is just to serve, to become an instrument of service or to die into service to God, meaning you do everything in order to bring the two into the one. You hand dualism into non-dualism. See, because the other part of me, there's a, still the third part in this it's more than schizophrenia, it's maltophrenia. The third part is this one, the top of the pyramid, the one eye, the ancient one. See? The one, the one. The Shema Yisroel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echod, the one. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It doesn't say one plus Dick, nor does it say one plus Satan. It says one. All the mishpach are included in the one. All of it. That means, uh, it's a Sanskrit word, it means extended family. <laughs> now, the predicament is, and this is very, uh, a very complicated situation to have so many personalities. Because Ram Das is, um, because he wants to get up, he's good. He's being good. He's righteous. His method, you're still separate. The one is beyond that. The one is beyond good and evil. G. Manley Hall's line, he who knows not that the prince of darkness is but the other face of the king of light knows not me. He who knows not that the prince of darkness is but the other face of the king of light, knows not me. Because there's only one. And one is behind good and evil, which means one is amoral. Not immoral, but amoral. Now, do you have the guts to acknowledge that part of yourself? Or are you too afraid to stop being righteous? Do you understand the problem? Is anybody here? 
I know you haven't decided I'm a good guy yet, but I am. You'll find out. You'll find out. You love me, and I love you, and it's all. Now it's going to be harder. <laughs> oh, dear. It's funny that as you see, the problem is that this one eye, this one eye that sees, what it sees as it looks out into the universe of forms is it sees law. It sees exquisite law, the way all forms, every thing in the universe is related to every other thing. You can do it through physics, you can do it through astronomy, you can do it through archaeology, you can do it through biogenetics, you can do it through the Torah, you can do it through the Tao, you can do it through the I Ching, you can do it through the... It's just law. Law, 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 law. Relationship. Lawfully related. At one level, natural law, not necessarily law that understood by the mind because the thinking mind is only part of the law. It's a thing. It's part of the law. It's happening. When you look out on a vast terrain of perfect lawful relationships, which includes everything, everything, like everything, like not only roses, but death and bombs and suffering. It looks out on all of it and sees perfection. It sees law perfectly manifested. Okay, now, come down into the human, in my case, Dick Alpert. Dick Alpert is a separate entity. Dick Alpert is in time and space. Dick Alpert is a body and a personality. Dick Alpert is a somebody. Dick Alpert is afraid because he is, he is something which is changing and decaying. I mean, this is a 1931 model I'm driving, you know? This is a decaying foot right before my very eye, you know? And if that's who I am, it's awfully scary. Because you know what? I have these incredible psychic powers, which I don't like to use because they're gross. But as I look out on this audience, I look out and I see, I see with my inner eye that you will all die. Okay. Bet you never knew that. Or you may believe you didn't. But you've got to remember Ramana Maharshi, who's dying and his devotees say, oh, Bhagwan, don't leave us, don't leave us. And he looked confused and he said, don't be silly, where could I go? I mean, I'm only selling the Ford, it's no big deal, you know. Don't leave us, don't leave us. I have this friend, Emmanuel. Emmanuel doesn't have a body. It's amazing. He speaks through a woman named Pat, and uh, it's amazing how many of my friends have no prejudices, so they say, until they hear about Emmanuel. Somehow my friends, they don't care whether they're big or little or old or young or black or white or yellow, as long as they have a body, turns out. <laughs> so, oh yes, I like Sam and Fred and Hannah. Well, Emmanuel, I don't know about whether I can accept you into my reality. Well, Emmanuel's still my friend, anyway. And I said to Emmanuel, what shall I tell people about death since I'm in the dying business? And he said, tell them it's absolutely safe. <laughs> he said, it's like taking off a tight shoe. <laughs> now, if you could stand looking at it from that point, but Dick Alpert, you see, is scared. And he is feeling like something went wrong way back at the beginning because he got separated from where the action is. 
somehow he bit the wrong breast or he did something wrong somewhere along the way and he just got it. He got separated from the source. And he learned that he was separate and he has been figuring, trying to figure a way to get back in. But the problem with the mind, the thinking mind, is the thinking mind thinks about something. And because it thinks about, thinks about something, it's always one thought away from where the action is. So as long as you identify with your thinking mind, as long as you bought that old saw, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, you're hooked into this horror of separateness for the rest of... Ah. Hmm. In Dick Alpert's heart, because it's a human heart and because a human heart has the quality of empathy, In Dick Albert's heart, he looks around at the pain in the world. And he can't even figure out how to begin to alleviate it. It's so unbearable everywhere he looks. I mean, he sees starving and he sees violence and he sees people in fear. And then he comes to the people who supposedly made it and he looks in their eyes and he doesn't see, he sees yearning. He sees, it's like a hell realm. And the pain that comes from that empathy is so unbearable that he's got to close his heart down because he can't handle it. Because if he tries to keep his heart open, he just burns out. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm on the good guy mailing list, and so I've got, you know, all those letters. Help me, 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 help us, help us, help us. You can just sort of, yes, that one, no, that one, yes, yes. This month I'll do that one, yes, yes, yes. I mean, how do you do it? You can't use your rational mind. It's no way. A whale's more important than, you know. So most people that are just identified with their separateness, with their Dick Alpertness, have a lot of pain and a lot of fear and a lot of, anytime anything goes good for them, they have a lot of guilt because of all the people for whom it's not going good. And they have a lot of driven quality to do good, to alleviate the suffering. Now, it's a far-out situation, you see, because just dealing with these two beings, this part, if somebody falls down in front of you, you say, that's karma. See? Okay. And this part of you can't pick them up fast enough and fell down with them and feels the pain and all of that. If we would be conscious, we are going to have to expand to embrace all these parts of ourselves. You can't cop out any longer. You can't hide behind being the victim. You have to accept the responsibility. It's as simple as that. In order to get free. Not because not you're good, just because you want to get free. Because you want to get back where it is. And to get back where it is, you have to accept that you are it. You have to accept that you are one. You are it. You have to find that place in your being. You have to quiet down. You have to go behind, between the thoughts. You have to open the heart. You have to increase the flow of energy. You have to learn what it means to be in love. 
until you can accept, just accept your own divinity. Isn't it far out? We are so busy mea culpa it that we can't allow the fact of our own beauty, of our own divinity, of the perfection of our being. How many times do you look at your life, like now, and say, it's perfect? Don't you usually say, it would be perfect if only. God, if you only hadn't screwed up, it would be perfect. But did you have to give me this face or mother-in-law or debt or fear of the future or sick child or whatever? Can you expand in order to include two parts of your being which seem quite paradoxical? If you were trying to put them into your rational mind, you would say it's paradox. For example, it's perfect, it stinks. For example, there's nothing to do, so do it. See, this says there's nothing to do, and this can only do. It does. It's a doer. It can't not do. As long as you're in form, you're doing. Even if you say, well, I'm not going to take part in this whole anti-nuclear business, you're not, you're sitting there like that is a vote. Isn't that bizarre? You are just, you are, your action, your non-action is an action just like any other action. People say, well, if there's nothing to do, I'm not going to do anything. I said, all right, which nothing are you going to do first? Well, I'm going to sit in bed. Okay, well, that's interesting. So you're sitting in bed. Now what? Well, i got to go to the bathroom. Okay. okay. Now what? Well, I'm hungry. Oh, there's nothing in the refrigerator. Well, and here we go. See, and you end up living life just like now, except you're doing nothing. <laughs> Instead of if I could only stop doing things so I could sit down and meditate. Why aren't you? This is it. This is the meditation. It's called life. Unless you get lost into the drama of it. I'm sure you have as seductive a melodrama as I do. And it's all so real and beautiful and serious and important. And And it is. But it isn't. It is and it isn't. That's part of the paradox. It is just a storyline. Somewhere here. What does it even look like? Oh, you got me. There you are. i got to explain, this is the first night I am daring to try to speak with contact lenses in, which means i got to put on reading glasses. Because they gave me two lenses, one for nearsighted and one for farsighted. And they were going to train my brain to rethink, but I've ended up really freaked. So at the moment, I'm using two long ones and a reading glass. This is Don Juan. You should know by now that a man of knowledge lives by acting. Not by thinking about acting, nor by thinking about, he will, about what he will think when he has finished acting. See, not by thinking about acting. A man of knowledge chooses a path with heart and follows it. And then he looks and he rejoices and he laughs. And then he sees and he knows. He knows that his life will be over altogether too soon. He knows that he, as well as everybody else, is not going anywhere. He knows because he sees that nothing is more important than anything else. In other words, a man of knowledge has no honor, no dignity, no family, no name, no country, but only life to be lived. And under these circumstances, his only tie to his fellow men is his controlled folly. 
Thus a man of knowledge endeavors and sweats and puffs. And if one looks at him, he is just like any ordinary man, except that the folly of his life is under control. Nothing being more important than anything else, a man of knowledge chooses any act and acts as if it matters to him. His controlled folly makes him say that what he does matters and makes him act as if it did, and yet he knows that it doesn't. So when he fulfills his acts, he retreats in peace, and whether his acts were good or bad or worked or didn't is in no way part of his concern. The greatest wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita says two major things. Do not identify with being the actor and do not be attached to the fruits of your actions. But most of us wonder if you're not attached to the fruits of your actions and if you're not identified with being the actor, why would you do it? Which is interesting. What would you do if you were not identified with the fruits of your actions and you were not identified with being the actor? Since you have to act anyway, what would happen is action would just happen. Like your heart is beating now. You're not busy beating your heart. Beat, damn you, beat, beat. It's just beating. It's going along fine. And many of you drive cars, I am sure, drive automobiles, and you're driving primarily, you can be driving, you can be talking to somebody, gossiping, or you can be looking in the mirror to see who's following you, or you can be doing numerous other things, all while you're doing this incredibly complex business with centrifugal and centripetal forces and huge speed and metal hurtling through space. I bet most of you do this. It's all going on in base brain. You're not even busy thinking about it. See, but there's a point where you say, well, I can handle a car, but not life. I got to think about that, you see. 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 And it's a lack of trust in your, in your innermost being, like Freud had. Freud was the second chakra aficionado. Yeah. And he saw that was the... I'll tell you what our work on earth is, if you want a secret. You and I, we're essences, we're awarenesses, we are souls, if you will, we are entities that have entered into a human birth which involves a body and a personality. In order to provide a series of experiences through which we can grow or awaken out of the illusion that, now ready for this curve, that we chose to create. Want it again? Is this too heavy, by the way? I mean, do you want me to change? Okay, because just tell me. I mean, I got any personality you want. It doesn't matter. It's a... How do you do? I'm Ram Dass. Just... <laughs> Hi, I'm Dick. You know, it's, it's all the same. You and I are awarenesses or entities that have chosen to enter into human incarnations in order to 
go through a series of experiences, which we are designing, through which we grow, and in the process of growing, we awaken out of the illusion which we have created. It's a little game we play with ourselves. It's God in drag. <laughs> See? It's like Plato's image of the cave, in which we are creating the shadows on the wall, which become the reality, and it's actually coming out of our projectors. It's our shadows we're projecting on the wall. You are seeing yourself writ large in the world. Inside you are all the different parts of your being, some of which don't even talk to each other. There's a part of you that's holding on to your little piece of the rock and is quietly at some level saying, go ahead, Haig, go do it, go do it. Like a sacrificial pig you're sending out to re represent the values you don't want to cop to. Save me, keep me safe. It's a little scary out there. Then there's another part of you that's feeling something's wrong, that intuitive heart space. And there's another part of you it's quite empty. There's a part of you that wants to be free. There's a part of you that wants to be safe. The part that wants to be safe can't hear the statement, give it all up and get it all. It says, well, I'd rather have my little peace than risking that. Each of us has so many parts in our being. What our work on earth in taking these human births is to integrate all these different planes of reality and all different parts of ourselves. It's like Ova Gandhi's tombstone is the statement, think of the poorest person you've ever seen and ask whether your next act will be of any use to that person. Did you ever try playing frisbee with that on your mind? See? See, how can I do that? Or can you do that? Like I'm on the board of the Seva Foundation, which is getting rid of um, blindness that is curable or preventable. It turns out that 80% of the world's blind are preventable or curable. Not a far out statistic. Mainly in third world countries. Mainly it's tetracycline drops or vitamin supplements or cataract operations. At the moment, there are seven to nine million people in India waiting for a cataract operation that takes four minutes and with inflation costs $10. And some of them will wait for the rest of their lives and they're now 30 years old. And being blind in a third world country is no bargain. 
it's not seeing eye dogsville. Ten dollars. What'd you do with your last ten bucks? I mean, I have to ask myself that. If it were my father that were blind, I know what I'd do with the ten dollars. For my uncle or my cousin or one of you that came up to me and said, I can't see, but for $10 I could see. Sorry, I'm going to the movies. Sorry, we plan to go out to dinner. Better luck next time. It's nice. It's okay. See what would happen. So there's a way in which you insulate yourself by saying, well, those people are them. There's us and there's them. In order to, it's like... You go into a plane of consciousness where you say, we're all one, except it's my television set. See? See, and you've got to figure out how to get all that together. Otherwise, it drives you up the wall. I don't know about you, but it drives me up the wall. It's like the uh, Islamic, the Sufi statement, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. very hard to figure out how to integrate all the parts of your beings. And what mainly people do is they buy into the one that gives them a kind of a limited kind of security of their somebodyness, and then they deny the rest of their being because it just doesn't fit with that reality. And they'd rather be safe than risk it. It's like I was with my mother the week before she was dying, and they had her under morphine because she was in a lot of pain. And I came to visit her. It was back in the 60s, and I think I was under mescaline. So we met. And in that space, there was a mother and a child, but we were sitting behind that. And there was life and death, but we were sitting behind that. We went into this space where she said, you know, Rich, I think I'm going to die. And I said, yeah, I think you are too. And she said, what do you suppose it's going to be like? And we talked like that. Now, can you hear that her model of reality didn't allow for that other space where there wasn't mother and there wasn't child and there wasn't goodness. It was just was. And the bizarre situation is that, all, that everybody, every human being on earth, continually is having experiences that are representing the parts of their being whose reality they are denying. And they treat it as error. That's the way you do it in science. Say, well, it's just error. It's like I was a personality researcher. And we could predict from knowing parents' behavior, children's behavior, up to a correlation of about 50, which means you account for 25% of the variability, which means 75% about of why kids are like they are, we have no idea about. We call that error. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> That'll include the soul, karma, reincarnation, all that stuff. That's error. Right? So it leaves space for speculation. I'm playing with the error variable these days. I used to think that the only people who knew about this stuff were people who had gone through an initiation like I had, which in specifically was like psilocybin or drugs. And I thought that was the club. One night I was giving a lecture, and it was in the 60s, and everybody was wearing white with flowers and smiling. Okay? And it was like the club meeting. Okay. And I was sort of an uncle to the club. Okay. And there was one woman sitting down in the front, and she had a hat on with strawberries and cherries, and she was about 70, and she had a black patent leather pocketbook and sensible Oxfords. And everything I said, no matter how outrageous, she went like this, see? And I thought, how does she know? Like... She's not an acid head. What, you know, I mean, it's just, 
what does she know that I don't, how could she, what does she do to get there? So by the end of the, I got obsessed with her. And at the end of the lecture, I kind of smiled and she walked over and she said, thank you so much. What you said just felt right, just so right. I said, how do you know? Because I kept getting more outrageous, you know, and, you know, just test her. I said, how do you know all this? How did you ever find this stuff out? And she leaned forward very conspiratorially, and she said, I crochet. <laughs> See, and at that moment, I knew the game was going to be more interesting than I thought it was. <laughs> And it's turning out to be so. If you look around at this audience, you will see a surprising amount of heterogeneity. Now, what are we all doing here? Mad. A shared madness. Because something happens somewhere along the way in the evolutionary sequence of things. Not the Darwinian evolution. That has to do with the packaging. But the evolution of essence or awareness or spirit or soul or whatever you want to... Psychic DNA predispositions. Okay? Whatever you want to call it. Something happens along the way in that where error starts to be treated as equally real with the other stuff. Where you flip from, like my father used to say to me, Richard, come down to reality. Okay. Took me years to see that that was just relatively real. I mean, when Walter Cronkite used to say, that's the way it is tonight, I used to believe him. And somewhere along the way, and it might have been crocheting, it might have been surfing, it might have been looking at the stars, it might have been a dream, it might have been sex, it might have been blah, 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 anything, as many as there are people. Somewhere along the way, even though those experiences are happening and happening and happening and happening, at some point you say, look at that. And because to acknowledge that other part of that other experience, to acknowledge it, just to accept, allow it to exist and not put it into a category that rejects it, immediately makes the whole way you were just relatively true. In other words, it shows you you aren't who you thought you were. Now, what is so bizarre is when we're born, we go into somebody training. See, we all get trained to be somebody. People used to ask me, what will you be when you grow up? And it took me years to realize that the question was irrelevant because I was never going to grow up. So when I was young, I said a doctor, and everybody said, oh, wonderful, wonderful. So I became a person becoming a doctor, which had a whole set of things connected. I was somebody. That's my son. He's going to be a doctor. And I preened and prawned and became more and more somebody. And then at some moment in my dance of this lifetime, I awakened to the realization that that's just who I thought I was and that who I was was entirely considerably different than that. It included that, but it didn't include a lot else besides. And from that moment on, I went into what you might call nobody training. 
In other words, extricating myself from the attachment to my own ego. Make no error, not destroying the ego, not stopping thought, because the ego is an absolutely beautiful instrument for efficient survival on this plane. You need it. But you don't need it as your master, you need it as your servant. So at some point you say, I'm not who I thought I was, and you start to move into the expandedness of your being, which has no name. It's the G-D, it's the unspeakable. Because every time you label it, you already just put a little thing around it saying, now I know who you are. But it's more than that. Can you describe this moment fully? If we asked everybody in this room, they'd give a different description. And isn't the moment all of this, at least? We are a little bit like the drunk who's looking for the watch under the street light, and when somebody comes along and helps them and they don't see the watch, they say, well, where exactly did you lose it? And he said, up in the alley. Well, what are you looking here for? He says, well, there's a light here. And we hold on to who we know ourselves to be. I know, I, I know uh, who I am. I read the papers on Sunday. Okay? It's like my definition of myself. Because it's too scary to not stand anywhere. It's like jumping out of an airplane with no parachute but there's no earth. Yeah, ooh, it's free fall, it's flying forever, forever. No, I'm Carl Jung, you know. Okay. See, everybody cops out finally because nobody wants to stand nowhere. Nobody wants to stand nowhere. We used to run, Wavy Gravy and I, a couple of years ago, we ran nobody for president in the last campaign because nobody can solve our economic problems and nobody really cares and nobody... <clears throat> and we, in the parade, we had a Pinto because nobody in his right mind drives in a Pinto. And I mean, we had a lot of things like that. <laughs> I was in... Uh, I was in uh, Adelaide, Australia, and I gave an interview to a woman. Oh, she, she, she and I were together in an interview situation, and the article came out, and it had the headline was Ramdas dot 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 still rather lost, and then there was a picture of me looking distinctly confused and upset, <laughs> and under it it said uh, Ramdas dot quote I don't know who I am unquote. It's like, if you know this amnesia vic victim, would you please contact the newspaper? <laughs> I mean, I did say that, and she did took the quote correctly. I said, I have no idea who I am. I don't know who I am. Isn't it funny when you see the flip side of the whole game, you know, for a moment? I'm somebody. Who are you? You look down, people walk down the street with these big nets saying, this is who I am. This is who you are. This is who I am. This is who you are. This is how it is. This is how it is. This is how it is. And we enter into these conspiracies. I'll make believe you are who you think you are if you'll make believe I am who I think I am. So. And it's very lonely inside those little cages. And what's fun is when you are starting to rest in that part of yourself that is behind your own melodrama. You're just here. You're behind, I'm behind Dick and Ram Dass. They're just doing their thing. You know, wind it up and out comes Dharma. That's the Ram Dass one. Dick's getting all he can. They're all doing fine. You know, and, here's, and I'm just sitting here. And you meet somebody else. And they're busy saying, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am. And you just look at them. And some people, they're just, they're not only ripe, they're there too, but they're busy 
caught in their game for a second, and you look at them, and the, like I get on a Fifth Avenue bus, a Third Avenue bus, a few years ago, and there's a woman, she's probably been cleaning somebody's apartment, she's got a shopping bag and a daily news under her arm, she's tired, and you know, she's going home, it's rush hour. And I got on the bus, and I looked down, all the eyes are averted. And there she is, she's looking at me, and the first thing she sees, is, her look is, what do you want, my money or my life? You know, I mean, it's like New York paranoia. And then I'm just looking at her, and then there's a flick, and right, she's right there. And at that moment, we are in love. We are suddenly in the space of love together. And it's very weird. What do you do about that? I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I'm sure many of you have. We have this funny thing about love. As long as we have identified with a separate package, we have been feeling deprived, and we never got enough. We're like a sponge that's dry. And so the minute you feel that feeling, you want to collect it. So you fall in love with somebody, meaning somebody is your connection to the place in yourself where you are love, and you want to connect, collect your connection, doesn't every junkie? Where are you going to be tomorrow? Who else are you serving? What else, you know, what are you going to be doing? You know, I want you around. Let's build a nest. Okay. So I can keep you. I want you because you're my connection to this place in myself. I can't get to without you. I'm in love with you, we say. And we get hooked on our method. And when people are in love with each other, they are hooked on each other as a method to get to the place in themselves where they are in love. And they say, I'm in love. And the whole world looks different when you're in love. Now, just imagine if by some weird thing you happen to flip into this place and just sort of sit in it for a while. What happens then? You're walking down the street and you look at somebody and you're in love because you're already in love. And the first person you see, you're in love. So your automatic reaction out of deprivation is, let's build a nest. Let's build nest, you say. It's built into the species. So you go and you build a nest, and then you say, I'm going down to the store to get veggie burgers and tofu. See? And you're at the checkout counter, and you look into the eyes of the checkout person, and you're in love. And you say, have you considered a menage a trois? Yeah. But how long can it go on? What are you going to do? Wear glasses that reflect inward? I mean, you're... So you either get to get out of that state or you better change your response pattern because economically it's a drag. It's like the situation, I've told this a number of times, but it's so delicious, about I, was, I did a series of records on, from some all-night radio shows on WBA in New York, and they came up called Love, Serve, Remember. And it was an album of six records and a beautiful book, and it was a box, and we shipped it all for four fifty. And even in pre-inflationary times, that was impressive. My father got a hold of it, and he said, beautiful production. He says, you know, you could get $10, $15 for this. I said, yeah, I know. He said, would you sell a lot less? I said, no, the same number of people would buy them. He said, well, I don't understand. If you can get $10 for it, the same number of people will buy it, why don't you charge $10? I said, well, it only cost me four and a half. He says, are you against capitalism? So I try to figure out how to explain it to him. He's a lawyer. I said, well, Dad, didn't you just try a case for Uncle Henry? He said, yeah. So was it a tough case? Damn right it was. You would worked hard, as I recall. I spent a lot of time in the library working for that case. I said, I bet you charged Henry a pretty handsome fee for that. Don't be silly. How could I charge Henry a fee? He's, part, he's a relative. He's part of the family. I said, well, that's my problem. If you find someone who isn't Uncle Henry, I'll rip him off. Can you hear the problem? That's the whole issue of right livelihood and how much you charge for things. 
Are you charging them or are you charging us? If you go into a plane of consciousness where we're all us and then come down and say, but I'm going to rip you off, how do you do it? How do you get it all together? That's what's called right livelihood. Livelihood that doesn't force you to treat other beings as objects, to keep them locked in their own separateness. That's why the Bible says, thou shalt not lust. Not that thou shalt not have sexual desire. What the hell is going to happen to the species? But that thou shalt not see other beings as objects to be exploited. Because when you do, you just get them stuck in their own objectness, and you get the karma on your head because you end up living in the paranoia you created. It's like you live in your own... Yeah. And that's why sometimes you get messages when you're open to your intuition that says, this one is all right and this one isn't. When you're tuned to your intuition, you don't need a book of rules. You don't need the thou shalt not and, yeah, and watch it. And, no, I won't, I won't, I won't do it again. You don't need that stuff because you are connected. If I am connected to my intuitive self in which I see that there is only one of us connected in form through law, how am I going to steal from you? It's like taking money out of one pocket and putting it in another. Now, the reason I point that up is because when we start to trust our intuitive heart connection to the universe, which is to the Tao, to the way of things, when we go beyond our thinking mind, which has opinions and discriminates this from that all the time, and we're in the this and that world, when we go inside beyond that, out of that resting in isness comes action, and that action is harmonious with the way of things. And what is interesting now is, for example, in the anti-nuclear movement, is the reason it has such sudden, immense, vast juice and power is because it's coming from that place in human beings. It's like a connection of truth. It's a whole other level. It's a kind of force or power that political power crumbles before. We are so used to living in the creations of our own thinking minds, which are these fabric, these kind of gossamer webs of thought forms. We've invested them with such juice that we forgot that it's just us that invested them with the juice. And that the juice we had to invest came from somewhere much deeper in all of our collective beings. And all that happens is, when what we have invested in doesn't feel right, something starts to happen. And the juice is withdrawn from that, and it's moved. And it's just a subtle movement of a thought form. The whole world condition is just a set of thought forms. Isn't that bizarre? I am a Jew. I am an Islam. I am going to kill you because of, you know. These are all thought forms. These are part of the dance we created. Isn't that bizarre? You want responsibility? See, I've spent the winter off duty. I spend the winters off duty, whatever that means, off Ram Dass. I detoxifying. I spend the week, winter being neurotic as Dick Alpert. See, in this winter I was in Jungian analysis and I was in a relationship and I'd find myself in the bathtub screaming with jealous rage. And I couldn't believe it. And I'd say, are you really doing this? But it, you know, I was still screaming with jealous rage. Crying, can you imagine that? Crying with jealousy. And I try, I thought, well, just breathe in and out. <laughs> and it didn't work. In fact, I used everything Ramdas teaches and none of it worked.
And I realized I just didn't want to get out of it yet. Because before I could get out of it in truth, because if I pushed it away, I've pushed it away for years. If I pushed it away, I give it juice. In the same way as if I grab it. If I, I don't have depressions, I am with God. <laughs> and you can look at that on that television channel all the time. I'm happy. Everything's wonderful. We are a joyful family. We live in Christ. God, poor Christ. Poor Jesus. Poor Jesus. Oh, Jesus deserves better than that. It's like a, a web of mind creating poor Jesus. Don't worry, Jesus can take care of himself. Okay, I won't. Jesus is doing very well these days. So you can't, you can't push it away. I tried that for years. Push it under the rug. Get down, Dick. Down, down, Dick. I'm Ramdas. Down, Dick. You know. <laughs> I used to, I used to wear gowns with beads, and I was Ramdas. You know, full time. I figured if I am it enough, sooner or later it'll rub off. You know. <laughs> and I found myself in the evenings putting on other clothes to sneak out for a pizza and a root beer. You know. <laughs> And then I realize you can't phony it because you lose. Hypocrisy is not liberation, I'll tell you. And so what I do is I open to, because Emmanuel, when I said to him, Emmanuel, what should I do with myself? He said, you're in a school. Why don't you try taking the curriculum? <laughs> yeah. Why don't you try being a human being for a change? You've been busy being holy for so long. Can I? Can I really? Is it okay? And I began to, it's the same thing what I remember once being sort of drunk with Alan Watts at a Benedictine monastery in the middle of the night <laughs> in his bedroom. And uh, Alan said to me, Dick, the trouble with you, and you always know you're really going to get the truth at that moment. The trouble with you is you're too attached to emptiness. And he was right on. I mean, that was absolutely right. I was so busy doing yoga. I was so busy taking drugs to get high, to get away from my lows, to push that stuff away and to get back into the, oh, I'm om, you know, phew, ah, phew, ah, om. Uh oh, coming down, coming down, you know. I... <laughs> but the if you just follow the sequence through, you see that when you awake out of your somebodyness, your two-ness, and start to acknowledge your oneness, the awareness, the isness, the the part you are, you always have been, you always will be, you're not going anywhere, you're not coming from anywhere, nothing's happening. You just are. It's just isness. It's all of it. It's all of it. That's the secret. That's the clue. All of it? It's all of it except dick. No, it's all of it. You mean? Yes. Far out. And all the time I treated that like a cancerous growth. He who knows not that the prince of darkness is but the other face of the king of light knows not me. Until I buy my humanity, I'm not free. I'm just high. And finally, it's freedom, not high. That's not what the game is. The game isn't high. The game is free. And free means you buy it all. You incorporate it into your being. You allow your own existence. You allow the fact that you are both divine and human. You allow that you are the two and you are the one, and you are the one in two. And at that moment, then you can hear Herman Hesse's Leo saying, that's just what life is. It's a beautiful game. And then you can hear the 
the Sanskrit word lela, meaning play or dance. Yes, it's a dance. It's a play. Because for a moment, you've come up for air, and there's a part of you that is resting in its being that has no fear and enjoys the way the form manifests and is delighted to watch it and sees that with this expanded awareness, certain things change in the way the form manifests. Like I find that I still have sexual desires, intense sexual desires, but I can't act on one of those desires towards another person if that action in some way increases their own sense of separateness, even though I might have the opportunity to do that. In other words, that expression of sexuality has to come out of the one. It cannot reinforce the two. Because for most of us that have taken a human birth, the big jump is the two recognizing the one. Then from there on, it's just a completion of the circle to see that the one is indeed at play as the two. And then I see Alexander Hager, you in there, far out. I'm in here. That's a weird one you got this time. There's one of us playing it too. It's not play, he says. <laughs> I'll wait, I say. That's like the, um, the, t the army that's coming into a country that's against the Buddhism in the country, and they're very cruel, and they're disemboweling the Buddhist monks. This is years way back. And uh, the officer of one of the groups comes into the town. He's very, very cruel. And he asks for a report from his adjutant, and the adjutant says, all the people in the village are bowing down to you, and all the monks in the monastery have fled to the mountains except for one monk. And the officer is furious that this monk isn't afraid of him. And he walks to the monastery, and he pushes open the gates of the monastery, and the monk is standing in the middle of the courtyard. And the officer walks through into, up to the monk, and he says, don't you know who I am? I could take my sword and run it through your belly without blinking an eye. And the monk said, and don't you know who I am? I could have your sword run through my belly without blinking an eye. You hear those two levels of power? Can you hear the perfection? Mahatma Gandhi, as he was in a train that was leaving the station, a reporter rushed up and said, Mahatma Ji, give me a message to take back to my people. And Mahatma Ji wrote on a piece of paper and handed it out because the train was already moving. And it said, my life is my message. Look at Christ. Look at Jesus. My life is my message. Watch. Here's the message. I'm going to show you you aren't who you think you are. Look, I'm human. Just like you, I bleed. Go ahead. I'm going to show you. You can spurn me, laugh at me, do it all. Nail me up. Go ahead, and in three days, I'll drop back and show you. I'll show you I am not just my individual differences. I'm just not the package, and you aren't either. The minute you know that, you are free of suffering because then suffering is grace. You don't enjoy it, but it's grace. Okay. See, that's an interesting one. That's a big one. You look back at your life now and you ask yourself, look at the ways in which you suffered. We all suffered lots in our lives. Look at the ways, and when you were in the middle of it, how much you were screaming to get out of it. But now when you look back, are you sure that that wasn't part of what allowed you to be in this moment now? And can you in some way see the sufferings of your past as grace? That's fine then, but now it's... Can you find the place in you where you can look at the sufferings now as grace? Ooh, heavy. Heavy. That's why I have a dying center, because the heaviest one is dying, and dying in pain.
You walk into a room and somebody's dying in pain, you say, oh, I'll come back later, I see you're busy dying. I had a wonderful woman, Jean Yeomans, she was in her 60s, she was a Quaker lady from Boston, Cambridge. Lovely, lovely lady, and she was dying. And she asked to see me, and I came over, and I came in, and she said, Ram Dass, I've finished this life, and I want to die, and I want you to help me die. And I just let that filter through me, because you, know, you just walk in empty, naked and empty, to a room with a person, any human being, all the time. If you walk in with rules, you immediately push them away. Well, I've got the manual of what you do with dying people. You're always friendly, and you're, you know, forget it. So I just walk in, I'm here. So I, when I listen to her being, what I hear is, she's saying, I don't like life anymore, I want to die. And I, th I said to her, Jean, who are you to decide when you'll die? You'll die when you'll die. Maybe you're going to lose each sense, sense by sense. Don't rush. Get it while you can. It's a precious human birth. She said, but Ram Dass, I'm so bored. I said, well, of course you're bored because you're so busy dying. I mean, if you do anything full time, it gets boring. Couldn't you say die five minutes an hour? You know, I'll die five minutes an hour. The rest of the time, you're just right here. You don't have to be, who are you? Oh, I'm dying. I mean, you'd be bored if you carried on all your roles. I'm a truck driver, but darling, we're in bed. No, I'm a truck driver. See, I mean... You can see that we are all many, many roles, but some of them are very captivating and you can't get out of them. They're so juiced up, they're so loaded, and dying is a big one. We're professional dyers, full-time dyers. And to sit with somebody and what you do with another human being, the act of compassion, which is bizarre. This is a bizarre twist if I ever heard one. The act of compassion, which is the balance of the head and the heart, which is balance of the perfection and the imperfection, of the pain and the bliss of seeing the grace. The balance of all that is compassion. And compassion is looking out on the universe and being and allowing people to suffer in the way they choose without judging their suffering. And being afraid, fear, being available to alleviate the suffering that people wish to alleviate. But not the suffering that you're projecting into them. It's like someone comes up to me and they come into my room and I'm, let's say, teaching Hatha Yoga, which I used to do. They say, I want to fast. I say, fine, fast for nine days. Well, I'd only plan to fast for seven. No fast for nine. It'll be good for you. Come in after seven days. Haven't eaten in seven days. Great. You're doing fine. Two more days, you'll be enlightened. Walk out on the street. I walk out on the street, and somebody comes up and says, Hey, man, you got a quarter. I haven't eaten in seven days. Good. You're doing fine. Two more days, and you'll be enlightened. Can you see how inappropriate? I, I mean, you obviously can see it. In one case, the person's breaking out of the web of their own mind and suffering through fasting as an intentional act. And the other one is somebody who wants to eat, and God comes to the hungry in the form of food. And you have to look around you and see that you are looking at a complete bell-shaped curve of uh, evolution all around you and that some people have different work to do than others. And it's not better or worse. It's not better to be 20 years old than 10 or 40 than 20. It's just different, and they have different work to do. And you may find that you have two children, and one of them's a very old being, and one's a very new being. And they have different work to do, and you're busy saying, no, you're both my kids. And the old one is having compassion on your predicament. Okay. All you can do for another human being is create an environment, no matter what act you do in relation to them, you create an environment in which they can get free if they choose to get free. And if they don't, you don't lay a trip on them. You can't force people to become free. You cannot do it. You can give them a cheap high, but you can't force them to be free.
So we're like with a mother and child, you mother and you nurture and you protect and you do all that, and you are the epitome of motherness in an impeccable warrior sense. But you are resting in that place behind all that also, where there is no mother and there is no child, so that if the child would come up for air, you're right there. Because you have recognized that we are in the world, but not of the world. When you hear that teaching, it's all different. I've been pushing you quite hard, I know. Let me tell you one sweet story, and then we'll take a break. We'll take a break for about 30 or 40 minutes because I'd like you to see all the tables outside that are concerned with what this is about. And I'd like you to say hello to each other. And those of you that have had more than enough can get out gracefully. <laughs> and then after that, the diehards or the stupid ones that still think there's more to get can come back and we'll play a game called Ask Dr. Das in which you make believe you have questions and I make believe I have answers. <laughs> and then we're going to sing a six-part round together, which is just great, okay? But don't go yet. I want to tell you one. Can you tell you I had one more story? Well, you're going to do it anyway. Cause, uh, I uh, have some friends, John and Tony Lilly, and uh, they play with dolphins, and they invited me to swim with the dolphins. So I, of course, said yes, and a friend and I went over to swim with the dolphins in a huge tank in Redwood City. California. And um, when I got into the tank, there's a platform you stand on, and then you go off into the deep water where you're swimming. So I got off the platform into the water, and the dolphins came over to me. They were with my friend over the other side, and they went by me very close. And they kept making passes. And the first thing I was aware of is that they are very large and very strong, and that I was in their territory. At which point, their names are Joe and Rosie, by the way. At which point, Joe came up to me and opened his mouth and put it on my wrist, which awakened every Jaws fantasy I'd ever had, you know. <laughs> and he did that to pull me out into the center of the tank to play. And then as he gently let go of my hand, I knew I was in a territory that my mind wasn't going to work in because I was busy thinking about the situation and scaring the hell out of myself. And so at that point, I just sort of gave up thinking about it or gave up a chunk of it. And immediately, Rosie was, was right here in the water. And I reached out very gently and touched her, expecting some horrible thing to happen. And she just stayed there. And I started to pat her or pet her or caress her. And she had this incredibly delicious skin. And just being with her, the recognition of her isness there, and something happened, and I just let go of my intellect completely. I just went into intuition. And within 10 seconds, Rosie was upright in front of me, her belly pressed against mine. I had my arms around her. She had her fins around me. I was kissing her on the mouth, saying, oh, Rosie, oh, Rosie, I love you so much. So then uh, she just hung out right here, and so I took her back fin and held on. I thought she might take me for a ride, but I was afraid of breaking the fin, so I sort of held on very lightly. And she swam down, and it slipped through my fingers, and I came up, and she'd immediately come back. And so after a while, I saw I couldn't do with the fin, so I just had the chutzpah to put my hand on the fin and put the other hand around her belly and just hold on. And she went down and swam, and I thought she wanted to get rid of me, so I let go, and I came back up, and she immediately came next to me again. So I held on this time, and I just held, and we started this wild swimming, just unbelievable experience. And every time I get to the place where I think, hey, look, Rosie, you're a dolphin, I'm a human, i got to breathe, <laughs> Rosie would come to the surface and wait, wait for me to take a breath, and then go back down again. And once... Rosie came up and some photographers were taking photographs and I got busy hamming it up. You know, here I am with the dolphins, you know, and I forgot to take a breath. 
See? And we went down, and I thought, uh-oh, here's where Rosie and I part company, because it only was a couple of seconds, and immediately Rosie came to the surface and waited. And after about 40 minutes, I was sort of, I was so in bliss and rapture, being with this kind of awareness that was so tuned. The last time I'd experienced that was when I was with my guru. And I was so blissful for me that I didn't want to let go, but my fatigue was great. I mean, it's a 50-year-old body, and, and it was cold that day. And I thought, gee, I'm tired. And the minute I thought that, Rosie came to the surface, pushed me away. Joe and Rosie came over, and they both stuck their noses against my belly and pushed me out of the tank and wouldn't let me back in the rest of the afternoon. And I had felt like I, that it's in the intuitive realm that I was going to make contact with these beings across species in which they were teaching me how to be in the universe and regain some kind of trust and attunement. What a blessing. I spent um, this winter, as I said, being neurotic and, um, and trying to figure out what it means to be human fully. I mean, just learning my humanity because you can't, See, you can't sort of stay like, I'm in the world but not of the world, So, and then I, you know, I'm in the world like that. No. You've got to really go in. You've got to really live life. Otherwise, you're just sort of hanging back and sort of playing at it. You've got to really... And the more your faith in your spiritual connection, the more you can drown in life and enjoy your uniqueness. And finally, liberation is you are totally unique. And you are also the one, so it's fine. It all comes together finally. So I spend a lot of time this winter trying to learn how to honor my uniqueness. Not out of I'm honoring my uniqueness, but really doing it. Ten minutes on that one before he finds out just where you aren't. Because he created it. And then after a while you get so you can handle an hour before you lose it. Hi, Dad, I love you. And then, Jesus, he brings me down. I mean, how much Yahtzee in baseball can I, you know, how much Yahtzee can I play in baseball can I watch? Yay, Red Sox, yay. <laughs> See, and then another thing happens, and it all changes into, how do you make love with a beloved? Well, sometimes it's in the form of father and son, and sometimes the relationship, the vehicle for the thing is Yahtzee. And baseball. Wow, here we are, wow. And it all just becomes just what it is, just living life hanging out with dad. It's nice, these stages, when it all gets really kind of relaxed and natural to be human. You say, well, wasn't that the way it was before? No. It's like somebody brings me their baby and they say, isn't it just like the Buddha? And I say, probably not. Because <laughs> okay. it looks like the Buddha and it sort of feels like the Buddha, but lurking in this little package are all of these latent desire is just waiting for the opportunity to manifest, just waiting for, you know. And to live life fully, uh, honoring your desires, not ignoring them, but being open to what is on beyond all of that too. Oh, how very nice. So part of one of my neuroses this winter, or working with my personality and all that stuff, was trying to figure out what it means to be a lover, what it means to be a friend, what it means to... and what it means to honor my uh, social responsibilities and how to play with social action. And I had the good fortune to hang out with a man named Daniel Ellsberg, who's a... through the Pentagon Papers, made a, a statement of considerable social significance and has been arrested many times at anti-nuclear sites. And uh, our dialogue was very interesting. And um, in the course of these discussions, he knew everything you could know about this stuff. I mean, he really knows the stuff. And he could tell me chilling tales by the hour. 
I mean, they just make your blood run cold. You know, all those wonderful stories about bombs dropping by era out of planes, you know, in this country in which five of the six safety mechanisms don't work. And if the sixth one didn't work, that would be the end of that area, that state, for the next 24,000 years. Little, little nice stories like that. Or stories about that every president since Truman has known consciously that he was using the threat of first strike as a card in his power hand. He was using the threat of massacring somewhere which would be around now, and even they, then they had the estimates all worked out computer-wise, massacring something like 600 million to a billion people. I mean, it makes Auschwitz look like uh, Tinker Toys. And on and on and on and on and on and on. More and more facts. And the facts had forced him into an urgency that was so intense. And he couldn't understand my equanimity as I heard all this. And we were together on a panel, an anti-nuclear panel, about three weeks ago. And I said at that panel, um, I am now, it's clear to me from my heart, my intuition, that I am in favor of a unilateral freeze. Okay. I'm in favor of a unilateral freeze of nuclear weapons, and if necessary, a buildup of traditional weapons in order to assuage the fears of people, because you tie your camel. and that I was considering an act of civil disobedience. Somebody raised their hand and said, how soon? And I said, I don't know. It'll happen when it feels right to happen. Now, I want to trust you the same way that I want to be trusted. So I don't want to tell you what to do. I don't want to tell you you ought to or you should because all I want to say is just listen and open yourself to all of what you are and all of what is and then act as mu with as much integrity as you can. And I want to announce to you that on May 30th, there will be a rally at the Savannah River bomb plant, 10 miles south of Aiken, South Carolina. And um, if you would like to take your children and family and go and camp out there and just stand and make a statement through being another being as part of it, just a number. I'll tell you one funny story if I may and then we'll take questions. Oh, yes. Time for one funny story. Could you turn the, uh, the lights up a little bit up out there? Just a little. Uh, when in the middle of this winter, I was being Dick Alpert, and um, I figured I had three months to be Dick Alpert, but I had made one error. I had agreed to give a sermon at a church in Tiburon. I was living in San Francisco, right in the middle of it. And um, so I had been up all night, as Dick Alpert does, and now it was the time of the Karmuppans because it was the morning when I was to go give the early morning sermon as Ramdas, obviously. They didn't invite Dick Alpert to give a sermon, I'll tell you. And so I was driving over the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, really bugged because Dick Alpert wanted to stay asleep and I didn't want to talk about love and God and all that shit. You know, I mean, it was like, I, I, you got to hear the horror of it. You've got to really open to what, it, what it's all about, to all of your total being. So I got to the church and, uh, on time, <laughs> and uh, it turned out that it was peace day, and there were these Buddhist monks who were walking from um, San Diego to Seattle. And they were passing through. I, I know they're walking through here. They're walking north to the United Nations meetings. And um, 
So we all honored them. They had doves, and they were beautiful, and we all honored them, and then they went away, and then there were readings from the scriptures, and then I gave my sermon, and I guess it was all right. I don't know. And then afterwards, somebody said to me, the monks are going to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge today. Uh, so we're all going to go. Are you going? Okay, now, Dick Alpert wants to get back to sleep immediately. So he says... Well, I remember commitments and you know, other points. You know, he, I mean, he does that. I'm very important, and I've got a big schedule, and you must understand that I would love to. And they all say, oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. And I get in the car, and I'm going home, and I see bed coming towards me. And I'm crossing the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's a beautiful, sunny day. And the city of San Francisco is all white and beautiful. And the sailboats are all out, and it's warm. And I think, you know, I've never walked across the Golden Gate Bridge. I could walk across the Golden Gate Bridge in all this beauty, and I could do it for peace as well. I could kill two birds with one stone. And suddenly, I didn't want to sleep so bad. And I thought, well, I could sleep later. So I got home, and I washed my face, and I drove back across the bridge, and I parked the car, and I got into the line. And I was just another one of the people walking across the bridge. And about halfway across the bridge, the horns were honking on the cars, and we were waving at everybody. And I was with this incredible group of lovely beings who just were caring human beings. All ages and old liberals and young idealists and, you know, just, just us. And there was a moment when I felt this feeling of I am absolutely that deep, deep feeling you're in the right place at the right moment. You know what that feels like? Yeah. Oh, boy. It's just right on. It was like just in the harmony of things. Just to be another one of them. And I'm learning. I'm listening. Like I want to go to the United Nations and just stand out there. Just as one, one more. One more. I once had a vision in which I... I came, I was drawn up into a place where there were all these elders. I'm sure they were the 12 elders or the, you know, they were ancient, and I'm sure somebody. And they said to me, do you want to go back? And I said, well, will it make a difference? And they said, well, look for yourself. And they were in some kind of a glass bottom scene where you could look down and I could see the earth and my microscopic eyes could see each being and I saw all the beings as little lights. And I saw that my going back would make the addition of one more. So where there was a 60 watt bulb, then I'd be a 61. You know, nothing to write home about, but just it made a difference. I said, I'll go back. It's really interesting about the role of the individual human heart. Very far out.